Okay, folks, here we are, part B, second part of this uh, perspective on high performance computing in the big data world, given by me, Jeffrey Fox, at the uh, HPDC 28th uh, um, edition of. And then the second part, we discuss uh, more ways we can actually align communities and also what the different communities are doing. So these communities here, we have AI systems, HPC, cloud, big data, data science, or what I somewhat prefer these days, the AI first approach. And we'll look at uh, how everything fits together. So if you sort of recap where we are, we have the HPC, or actually more precise, the HPDC, because if you look at modern cloud computing, it's more distributed computing than cluster computing. It's them mixed together, which is the whole philosophy behind HPDC, high performance distributed computing. And if you look at the number of students going into the field, the papers published, which we surveyed, the new faculty ads, it's, uh, it's not uh, a decline, it's not declined dramatically, but it's certainly not, it does not seem to be growing. And that's a, so you could view this as slightly surprising because we're living in the big data world. Now, it seems sort of trivially obvious if you need big anything, the reason HPC was born is big simulations. Well, why wouldn't big data need HPC? Uh, in fact, it obviously does need HPC, except possibly for Hadoop style big data management where you're, where you're stinging bytes around, where you still actually need high performance, but it's high performance on the I.O. side. And MPI-IO is not the best way to do that. So anyway, so why is that? It's possibly because the communities are not well aligned, because industry is suddenly using HPC. Industry adopted GPUs to process both Bitcoin and um, deep learning with dramatic acceleration. And uh, we need to... Uh, Pay attention to that because this mainstream, which I equivalence with industry for this talk, is larger. And it's got a, in the, by, when you say it's supported by industry, immediately billions of dollars flow in. There is a conference, a recent new conference called SysML, which is sort of relevant to look at because um, it has. Uh, it has actually talks on what I would consider HPC for uh, big data. And it's, uh, but it's only a mainstream systems. And in fact, the word systems is probably what I should have listed on some of those communities, because the systems community um, includes the HPC community. And as well, there was a time when systems people focused on parallel computing and then HPC, and now they're focused on bioinformatics and machine learning and things like that. And the machine learning community is sort of separate from the actual traditional systems community. This conference is quite interesting because it has a 50-50 ratio essentially between academic and industry talks. There is a strong cloud community. I still remember when clouds were of five to 10% of the, of the world and people were discussing whether how, how well they would do. Well, there is no doubt what's happened. Clouds have been incredibly successful. They're growing almost 30% per year public clouds, and um, the only trouble is that this strength is focused in industry. And it is not very large academically, but in terms of either the use of clouds to do science or in the research. There is some good, solid, good and exciting research in, in clouds academically. But as industry has all the data or most of the data, and has such a strong interest in making clouds run incredibly well, because it's their bread and butter, uh, then academic uh, contributions are, are not so easy to make. The big data community, I think, is actually pretty strong in both academic, uh, academia and industry. It's not quite so well defined, and because uh, um, lots of things are big data, is certainly growing, as we saw in the conference. Uh, but still, we noted it's actually quite small in terms of su summed over, over activities. Uh, I would say myself that I'm part of the big data community. Because I only use HP, although I 
will have a long involvement with HPC, I tend to use it when necessary. And I, but I'm always doing big data because that's what everything is these days. Uh, so if we sort of uh, make a little cosmic slide on the importance of AI, uh, we, and this is sort of underlies why we're discussing all of this. There is little doubt based on Wall Street and, in, and sort of obvious progress in both science and industry that AI and the parts of machine learning will dominate over the next 10 years. It will have incredibly distinctive impact on applications. HPC clouds and big data are, are essential because you can't actually use AI without HPC and clouds and big data is actually, if you like, the uh, the umbrella field for putting machine learning into into action. But um, somehow they're not quite as dramatic as AI. And um, we have this term AI first. I give her here a set of um, web clips. The race for AI. Um, where all these companies are grabbing startups. Google, Facebook, and Microsoft are remaking themselves around AI. Google, the full stack AI company. Bezos says AI to fuel Amazon's success. Microsoft says AI is the ultimate breakthrough. Tesla, was new AI guru, will help cars teach themselves. Um, Netflix is using AI to conquer the world. Google is remaking itself as a machine learning first. Well, that's a variant of what I call AI first. And here, if you love machine learning, you should check out General Electric, who in his software, with his software like Predix, and the Industrial Internet of Things is clearly a, a major player in the, AI, in the AI. And AI is essential for modern manufacturing and modern machines. So we have, obviously, a very strong effort in data science, both in industry and academically. But there is an alternative way of thinking about this, which is AI first, followed by a subject, such as AI first physics, which is the use of AI as a driver of physics. AI first engineering, cyber infrastructure, social science, history, what have you. And it's not clear to me that AI first is not a clearer way of explaining what you're doing. Because data science, it's not very clear what it is. Is it just the study of machine learning or what? I have some other slides in a longer presentation which explore that issue. All right, now we discuss a little bit about what industry is doing and how we could possibly uh, align with it effectively. So I have actually uh, four area of topics which I will discuss. And we have a variant of these slides each of the areas. So we have the importance of clouds, a uh, rather small summary, I mean, a more focused topic, I should say, ML Perf, the so called global AI supercomputer, and this wonderful phrase, machine learning for systems and systems for machine learning, which comes from Google's Jeffrey Dean. Which is, and there we'll follow that with the next major section on using machine learning to transform computing. All right. All right, the first of our industry alignment uh, issues is the dominance of cloud computing. Uh, these figures and pictures come from a report by Cisco, which uh, started around a couple of years ago, but it was updated in November 2018, and the lessons are essentially unchanged in 2018. And clouds are growing 22% per year. And that's actually public clouds are growing even faster than that, and private clouds only 11% per year. But traditional data centers are declining 5% per year. Um, if you look at how this increase is um, happening, you can see it's partly due to the workloads per server that that's going up from. Uh, by clouds are in 2016 are 3.6 times as many as uh, as um, traditional centers, and that number is essentially constant, but is now, that means 13 per server instead of 3.8 per server. In another um, interesting figure is how many large data centers are there, which are called hyperscale data centers in the jargon, which I think came from Gartner, but maybe from, they certainly Gartner uses it, maybe it comes from somebody else. 
The number of giant data centers going up 13% per year, and it's going to reach uh, over 600 in 2021. If you ask how many computers there are, it's maybe 50 million. I don't know. It's very difficult to tell because that's a proprietary secret. So you can't actually extract it from from the published data from all these uh, cloud vendors, except sometimes you can get some accidental hints. All right, the next topic, ML Puff. Well, this is a much more focused comment here. We were talking about the clouds being a cosmic issue affecting everything. ML Puff is a simple, elegant project uh, organized by industry and some in leading edge academia, Berkeley, uh, MIT, Harvard, um, Stanford, um, places, several places, nine, nine places. Uh, but there are about 70, I think, industry people. It was started uh, a year ago. And it is basically uh, a collection of data sets and a collection of me measurements trying to build up a, uh, an understanding of what, how to get good performance in machine learning. Um, they started with training, uh, and um, then they now have added inference. So they do inference and training, which of course have rather different characteristics. Uh, training takes a lot longer, but inference also has to run with high performance because it's often done on the edge, um, away from the giant cloud. And they keep, they have a rather, uh, they have a, some good processes. There are various working groups. I go to the research working group, the HPC working group, and the uh, deep learning for time series working group. But there are others, even larger working groups than that on the mainstream industry foci. I think this is, science should look at this, or academia should look at this and either join it or set up something similar to this. Uh, I think we need to do more than we're now doing on understanding the performance of machine learning on systems of various types. And it has to cover both I.O. and compute. Otherwise, we, I, I don't think we can continue just using top 500 and things like that. That's too small and or even deep 500. Those are, they're not, um, I haven't got quite the rigor, rigor and relevance of ML Perf. Uh, here is an example of some information gathered by ML Perf, which uh, I, we have actually a couple here from uh, Indiana at the bottom, which I added. Uh, the IndyCar racing data set is very exciting. That's Judy Chu, and she also did some work on uh, clustering for Twitter, online Twitter data. So these are all. Um, possible and important uh, time series, which um, either typically involve deep learning, although not, it's not clear that deep learning is, can be used if you really want to have real time, truly real time results. Because there's uh, these applications like uh, right hailing, I don't think you need the answer in 10 nanoseconds. If you're looking for the trends in that to know how to route your cars, I think delays of uh, seconds is quite acceptable. So they, that's another interesting feature. Now if you look at this, we have cars, medical, security, the overall statistics of the world, stock market, where we know uh, being a nanosecond ahead is um, important. We have climate, where Bill Tang has done some wonderful work on Tucker Maps and using, well, using AI on uh, data measurements to predict the instabilities. There are events and software systems, and of course, language and translation and speech are very important, because that's, that's a dominant industry application, where real time or very near real time results are certainly important. They have to be done. So they, are, they need to be done um, possibly not quite as fast as the racing car, which has to be done immediately before the car crashes. That's going 200 miles an hour, so that's pretty fast. Um, so let's let's move on. All right, our third example: the global AI supercomputer. All right, we should 
be part of this concept. So, the Microsoft had a very good faculty summit in 2018, which I was privileged to be invited to. And there in the summary, they pointed out that they were building a global AI supercomputer. We will discuss the, the meaning of this uh, in the next slide. The word global is important because it means it's shared. Well, it actually isn't shared because Microsoft, Google, Amazon have their own supercomputers. But it is true that if we look at the world, the AI impact on the world is going to be done by the sum of all the different supercomputers, and hopefully including supercomputers owned by scientists doing things for the good of the world and maybe even solving scientific research questions. Uh, it's worth noting that as espoused by Microsoft, that is AI on the edge and AI on the cloud, and they're linked together, of course, by high-speed nets, which are getting better and better. And you're obviously going to do more training on the cloud and more inference on the edge. And um, you're going to, what I discussed latency in the previous slide, depending on the latency of the required reaction, you're going to decide where to do it. So we look at this here, here for instance, clouds are not so to be so clearly trusted. They have infinite capability, and they will certainly be the place to go if you want to get all the world's data. Edges have low latency. They can be somewhat trusted if they're because they're not in, con in, in contact with uh, contaminating devices. They are obviously limited, and they obviously are typical. Whether we have cameras, speakers, watches, smartphones, dot dot dot. So. Global says it is an HPDC, it's a high performance distributed computing system. It's distributed within each vendor. Microsoft's global supercomputer is not in one place, it's spread over the world, and they say it's also spread over vendors. I actually use the term global AI and modeling supercomputer, which is my suggested um, cosmic architecture, because we want to include modeling, because we have to do models to uh, do AI. And we have to do models to do simulation, where we want to create the digital twins for industry, or, or study, uh, um, you know, what is it, protein folding and things for science. That those are all done by supercomputers. So we need modeling supercomputers. So I want to do integrate big data and simulation within this concept. Notice that uh, when, when Compared to, say, the old ideas of grids, uh, we have here a grid, um, which is the edge part of the global AI supercomputer. The cloud part of the global AI supercomputer is sort of at the logical center of the system, but is physically distributed. So it's a physically distributed, logically centralized uh, system. Although there are multiple centers, because we have Google, uh, Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, Amazon. Etc. Alibaba. Um, so we're going to, as I've said, it is essential to use HPC to do almost anything in the global AI and modeling supercomputer. And this is what we call a later concept called HPC for machine learning. That we must use HPC to get good results on machine learning. And we also must support the IO centric data management, which is what Hadoop. Uh, is, uh, sent, is, uh, was originally designed to do, and Spark and Flink and uh, other kind of other systems like that are, are dominant players. There are various controversies about how you actually build what I can call an HPC cloud. Likely, what is the nature of the I/O system? Is it Lustre or HDFS or simulated HDFS on Lustre? What is the importance of SSD and non-volatile memory? And we also need, to, in my opinion, to fix MPI so it automatically runs well on cloud technologies like Mesos and Kubernetes and cloud languages like Java and Python. Okay, that's the end of that. So we need to take the global AI and modeling supercomputer and integrate it between industry and academia. Last topic which is uh, heads towards the major thrust of this particular talk, machine learning for systems and systems for machine learning. 
And so that was a talk by Jeffrey Dean at NIPS in 2017 or December. And he discussed the machine learning actually for something which I uh, have worked on many times, optimizing parallel computing, load balancing. Uh, he did this, this is a wonderful paper on learning index structures and showing how it does better than the traditional uh, best methods. There is uh, machine learning for data center efficiency and machine learning to replace heuristics and user choices, which I would summarize as auto-tuning, because that's effectively what tuning is. Heuristics and user choices are tuning, setting up the configurations of your systems. And um, so this thing on the up from this oh, thing here is his slide, and uh, he has done the world a great benefit by explaining these ideas. So if you look at the world systems in his discussion, well, for this talk, I'm going to replace systems by HPC. Because I told you, I think HPC is needed for essentially all of these systems. We could also replace it by cyber infrastructure, by HPDC. But uh, and I'm sure you can actually call it systems. It's still actually systems. Um, so I, I use HPC because I want to focus on systems that can support big data, big simulation, and therefore always involve HPC. So we now get uh, M machine learning for HPC and HPC for machine learning, or I say for this particular conference, HPDC, we could replace HPC by HPDC. Uh, and now we have these HPC for machine learning is what I've actually worked on for the last five years. I think it's quite well studied, it's very important. It is not revolutionary. It is evolutionary, and it makes data analytics run faster. However, machine learning for HPC is revolutionary. Uh, some parts of it are evolutionary, like some of the auto-tuning are just doing better auto-tuning. But some of it, like producing surrogates, so you learn the results of a simulation or a digital twin, I think those are revolutionary. Um, I say at this faculty summit, there was a lot of discussion with our machine learning to improve big data systems, which is ML for systems, where they were improving MySQL, um, Hadoop, and things like that. All right. Next, last slide coming up, which is just a discussion of, of uh, the topics in. Um, ML for HPC. Uh, on a longer talk, I will discuss. Uh, I discuss uh, HPC for ML in a little detail, but I don't do that here. So if we look at this sort of what I consider the key transformative idea, we can actually get four ways of doing ML for HPC. So uh, two I put at the top, which I don't discuss in detail. One is ML after HPC. So you run your HPC and then you do machine learning. And so that is typified by you, very successful, it's using machine learning to analyze the results of HPC. There's a lot of work on the NSF and DOE supercomputers doing that, especially in molecular uh, simulations, uh, where you're trying to look at trajectories, see how what that structure is and how they cluster, and also look at the structure formed in the simulation. There's also what I call ML control, where we're using simulations <coughs> and machine learning to control experiments. And I, I've already mentioned the work of Bill Tang and that area on Tokamak data. And um, here actually producing what's called here ML around HPC, which is simulation surrogates, are particularly valuable because they actually speed up the prediction of what's going to happen. And if you're trying to run a Tucker map, which will explode unless you can, unless you adjust quickly to be able to get reliable predictions without uh, booting up a giant supercomputer and solving uh, your equations, uh, your uh, fusion equations from scratch, that's very important. The two topics which I discuss uh, in this talk are ML auto tuning using machine learning to configure. Machine learning or HPC. So notice everything when I do ML for HPC, that HPC is HPC running simulations or HPC running big data. Now the most exciting part is ML around HPC, 
where we're using ML to learn from the simulation, produce surrogates, uh, um, speed up everything, get zeta scale computing, and uh, also to do a version of a data assimilation, which is much more powerful than the current ways it's being done. All right, so that's the end of this uh, part B of the presentation. I thank you for listening to it.